Okay, I see a little live coming up. I guess that means we're on. Yeah, I think we're on YouTube. Uh, okay. And we're probably still waiting for Facebook. Yeah. And Just about five seconds now. And you can start. Okay, then. Hello and welcome to this session on physics of crystallography. I'm Manuel Lengle, I'm uh, from the NC of Austria and I will be the moderator today. And I'm very happy to introduce our speaker of today, Sven Lirin. He uh, has been a graduate student and a postgraduate student at Lund University in Sweden. Then he became a postdoc, he, he became a postdoc uh, for applied mathematics in Australia, and then he was a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute in Stuttgart for Festkörperforschung. And after that, he went back to Lund to become an associate professor and later professor in inorganic chemistry. Oh no, he became a professor in Stockholm for inorganic chemistry. And at the moment, see, he's president professor of inorganic materials in Lund. So I guess he went back from Stockholm to Lund. And uh, he's also general secretary of the U. He was general secretary of the U IUCR from 2005 to 2011, and he's present the president of the IUCR since 2017. And I am. I guess he will tell us uh, what the IU IUCR is. And I'm happy to welcome him. And now I will give the word to him. And I'm, I'm looking forward to his presentation. Well, thank you very much. So I'm here to tell you a little bit about what the IUCR is and what it does. And the IUCR is the International Union of Crystallography. And uh, it was inaugurated in 1947, so it has a few years. Um, and it's, a, it's an international union of scientific associates. And this means that members are countries. And the, um, on the world map that I'm showing you here, uh, all the member countries are colored in red. And you can see that there is a, that we still have uh, rather few members in Africa, uh, but that we are a truly international scientific union. Uh, the member countries are also associated into into regional associates, uh, the ECA, the European Crystallographic Association, organizes the European countries and the African countries, but there is an initiative to form an African Crystallographic Association. ASCA uh, is organizing the members in Asia. The ACA has members in North America and the LACA has members in South America. The IUCR is also a publishing company. Uh, we have at the moment uh, 10 journals that are published with the IUCR logo, logo. And sometimes I say that the IUCR is a scientific union masquerading as a publishing house, or perhaps it's a publishing house masquerading as a scientific union. Now, this used to be a very common situation. The, the big scientific union used to be where publishing was being performed most of the time. Now we are in a situation where publishing of course is in the hands of big publishing houses and also the IUCR journals is produced by one of these houses. But we have maintained a lot of control of, how, of the production and the, and the um, technical editing of the journals to try to maintain as high scientific standards as possible of what we produce. We believe that the journals is a very, very important way for us to serve our members because to have well-functioning journals with a well-functioning refereeing system is absolutely vital to science. Uh, we also think that our journals are important vehicles for photographic education. The 
IUCR's members are countries, as I said, which means that our activities, of course, are mostly our meetings. But between meetings, we have a triennial meeting, which was due to take place this summer, but which has been postponed for next summer. And fingers crossed, we'll be able to hold it. But the commissions are doing the, the work for the union between Congresses. And commissions are organizations that promote their areas of interest within crystallography. They are consultants for the International Program Committee of our big Congress. Uh, they added reference bodies for applications to the subcommittee of the Union calendar. That is, we support meetings economically uh, within our science, uh, outside of our, of our own Congress, we support a lot of meetings, uh, particularly uh, young scientists and particularly from countries where crystallography is not yet as strong as it is in some places. And the commissions have a vital role in keeping us up to date about what is happening in our science, because it's a very widespread science. There are many specialty areas and we need to see where we need to develop in order to encompass as much of it as we just can. The commissions uh, deal with all the subjects uh, in this screen. So aperiodic materials, sorry, aperiodic crystals, magnetic structures, crystal growth, nomenclature, high pressure, powder diffraction, structural chemistry, materials, computing, teaching, art, NMR, XAFs, Axe and Sands, biological macromolecules, mathematical crystallography, inorganic and mineral structures, electron crystallography, <sighs> neutron scattering, quantum crystallography, and synchrotron radiation. As you can see, our non-publishing commissions, as these are known, uh, slice up the area of crystallography in, in very many different directions. Um, there are interest areas such as biological macromolecules or aperiodic crystals which deal with specific kinds of material. There are other commissions that deal with the, the borderline between our technique and other techniques such as NMR or XAFs. And there are commissions that deal with specialized techniques such as high pressure diffraction, powder diffraction. And all in all, we try to maintain a, a very wide range of activities within the International Union to keep us alive while still maintaining a focus on structural chemistry, which is where we came from. A very important part of our activities is outreach. And we, together with the um, in the International Science Council, the ISC, uh, we have a big project called LAMP, uh, which is uh, about light sources for Africa, the Americas, Asia, and the Middle East. Um, we have found that synchrotron radiation sources are not only important for driving science, but they are extremely important for driving the scientific community. And new light sources tend to be gathering places and hotspots where young scientists come together to define new research area in their region. And this is why LAMP is such a very, very important program. We have an initiative for crystallography in Africa. Uh, there is a collaborative project together with UNESCO uh, where we sponsor open labs. Uh, these are crystallography labs around the world where either personnel uh, that are sponsored or, or um, chosen by us, or equipment uh, is being funneled through our channels to, to help build new uh, scientific infrastructure. Uh, many of these activities started in the International Year of Crystallography a few years ago, uh, which has now morphed into the movement Crystallography Matters More. But crystallography is mostly about people. Um, 
these images are just a few snapshots from various uh, biennial congresses. The, the black and white picture in the center is from the first Congress, which was held in 1949. And the various pictures come from all the way back from 1949 and up to the last meeting in Hyderabad three years ago. And this, of course, brings me to something else. So this is what's the International Union of Crystallography. But then what is crystallography? Um, why, why, why is it, uh, what is it? And why has it become such an extraordinarily useful method? Because as I will show you later on during this talk, crystallography has become the method of choice in a very large number of scientific areas. So I think I would like to illustrate this. Well, I know I want to illustrate it because I'm doing it uh, with a picture. Um, some of you may recognize this as a scene from the film, The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. And when I watched this movie, there were a couple of things that struck me. One of them, of course, is that Tuko, the guy in the center here, is someone I recognize from somewhere else. You know how, how it works. You see an actor, you've seen her or him in another movie, and you, you have to think very, very carefully to recognize. So, so where was this? This is an impressive um, feat of memory and pattern recognition that humans are very good at. So it took me a while to recognize that, of course, Eli Walsh is also Don Altobello from The Godfather Three, here receiving the, uh, the poison cannoli from the Corleone family. But it's interesting that, that in The Good, the Bad and the Ugly, Eli Walsh was a young man. And when he played Don Altobello, he was an aging actor. Um, still unmistakable. And although I had only seen The Godfather a long time ago, I somewhere at the back of my mind, it was clear that I had seen that face. But there was another thing in this picture that struck me, and that is that the gun dealer, I thought I had seen him as well somewhere else. And of course, he's the spitting image of Max Planck. You can even overlay their faces and you see it's very much the same person, although I'm sure it wasn't Max Planck who played the gun dealer. My point is, images are extremely important to our way of understanding the world around us. And I believe that this is a very important part of the success of crystallography. It provides us with images of the atomic world. And in some ways, it's shaped the way we look at science because when we can produce images, we tend to use them and we tend to favor areas where images can be produced. I'll give you another example. These are images of French actresses at the Comédie Française at the turn of last century, impersonating La Giaconda, the Mona Lisa. And although they're all different, um, there is no problem in recognizing what they're trying to impersonate. In fact, even when you make images that just have a very superficial likeness to the Mona Lisa, you recognize it immediately because of its, its iconic character. That is due to the power of the image. So even if Botero does his version, it's very clear that it's Mona Lisa. Or if another artist draws the Mona Lisa, you still see this is the same image with a big difference. But we are very quick in processing information to show us the likenesses and the differences. We are simply very good at interpreting images. I'll give you one more. The montage of a bicycle saddle and a pair of handlebars by Picasso are unmistakably a bull. 
we read these pictures very quickly and very simply. And that is the power of the image, which has served crystallography so well. I would even argue that images change the way we look at science. I will show you the cover images of Science Magazine on one month, um, sorry, for all the issues from 1880, 1910, 1940, and so on, with a 30 year gap, and of course, ending up last year. And it's very clear what's happened uh, in our ability re to reproduce images. But I think it has also changed the way that we think about the image and how it's linked to science. In 1880, there were no images on the cover. 30 years later, drawings started to appear, although the majority of the covers were just text. Another 30 years later, all the covers were covered with images in black and white. Wait another 30 years and you see the appearance of the first color image. Again, 30 years later, all the issues have color pictures on the cover and nothing much changed during the 20 years from 2000 to 2019. Although now, of course, with the face of publishing changing again, we are getting moving images as the, as the representative of, of the first page. This is changing the way we look at information. I think this has benefited the technique of X-ray diffraction in a big way, because what we produce is largely high resolution images of scientifically interesting molecules and materials. Now crystallography is about crystals. Um, and in the strict sense, crystallography is looking at the diffraction pattern of a material and calculating backwards to the positions of atoms in real space. And crystals come in many forms and shapes, sizes. At the top right, you see gypsum crystals from Nica in the Chihuahua region of Mexico. These crystals reach more than 12 meters in length and 50 metric tons in weight. And they have been growing underground for a period of hundreds of thousands of years under very, very stable conditions. At the bottom left, we see cerium oxide as seen in an electron microscope. What is really interesting is that these cerium oxide crystals were re-photographed 10 years later. And because of precise possibilities of, of localizing uh, an object in an electron microscope, actually we could show that they looked exactly the same 10 years later. Although there can be a lot of movement in the crystal, they can also be surprisingly stable, even when they are as small as those in the image to the bottom left. So how did crystallography come about? Well, this is the title page of a book that was published in 1913, New Era in Chemistry. Um, very interesting book covering developments during what was then the last quarter of a century. And note the date or note the, note the year 1913. It's a very interesting year. Now in this book, the author, Harry Jones, makes a very interesting statement. We know the geometrical forms in which it crystallizes, and we know something about the way in which solid conducts the different forms of energy, heat, light, and electricity. And now, we know, however, very little about the internal mechanism of solid. 
We do not know the simplest laws to which solid matter conforms. We do not even know the molecular weights of the simplest substances in the solid state. We do not know what's the formula of solid sodium chloride or rock salt or of solid water or ice. And we have no reliable means at present of finding out those simplest matters about solids. Our ignorance of solids is very nearly complete. Now, again, this is published in 1913. What is interesting is that a few years earlier, William Röntgen was sitting in his home on the 8th of November, 1895, and he was bored because there was nothing good on television. And so what he did was when there is nothing good on television, you, you fiddle with the television set. Now, he didn't strictly have a television set, but he did have a cath cathode ray tube, which is pretty much a television set with very, very poor reception. The, since there was nothing to be seen, instead he fiddled with the technique of this tube and he upped the voltage and out came x-rays. And for this discovery, he was awarded with the first Nobel Prize in Physics in 1901. Now, what's interesting is that this is, of course, many years before the statement that we have no reliable means of finding out anything about solids. But Röntgen was not a solid state scientist. His interest was in the nature. And the nature of X-rays was shown a little bit later by Laue, Knipping and Friedrich in 1912 by the famous experiment for which Max von Laue got the Nobel Prize in 1914, where he showed that a single crystal of copper sulfate gave a diffraction pattern such as we see to the left. Now, this is still not anything that tells us something about the position of the atoms. And Max von Lauer's interest was in showing the wave nature of X-rays. But note again, 1912, so this is the year before the book about our ignorance of solids came out. In the very same year, 1912, Lawrence and Henry Brack did an experiment using X-rays on table salt, sodium chloride, and they solved the structure of sodium chloride, and they shared the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1915. And so the statement in the book, A New Era for Chemistry, really came in the nick of time. Just a year later, it would have been very difficult to say that we don't know anything about solids. Actually, after the Bragg's experiment, solids became the kind of matter that we know most about. It was really transformative in how it changed the way we look at solids. There's an interesting story in this as well, because note that the same year that Lauer did his experiment, the Bragg's did their experiment. And this is an example of news traveling extremely quickly. And the reason is very simple. There was a postdoc working in the laboratory of the Bragg's. His name was Lars Vega, he was a Norwegian. And he wasn't only a postdoc, but he was also a postdoc who dared take a vacation. He spent that vacation in Munich. He happened to be there when the experiment by Knipping and, and von Lauer was announced. And he realized immediately this is the method that the Braggs are looking for in their research on materials. And he returned to Great Britain and the rest is history. So it does show you that when you do your postdocs, make sure to take a good vacation, it'll serve you well. Now, this method of crystallography has taken us to the face of Mars. So the Mars rover uh, had a small powder diffractometer built in, and it was able to make 
measurements of samples from Mars surface and show that they contain a phyllosilicate, which is identical to one uh, of terrestrial origin. And on Earth, we know that these minerals only form in the presence of running water. Very, very strong indication that there was, at some time, running water on the surface of Mars. Through high pressure crystallography, we have been able to look at the configurations of minerals that are present at the outer core of the Earth at immense pressures and temperatures, uh, which we can recreate in small diamond anvil cells to probe what is the state of matter that should be present in these regions of the Earth. It is simply a very, very versatile method. The area that has been most revolutionized by the knowledge we can get from crystallography is probably life sciences. And in 1962, um, there were two Nobel Prizes for X-ray work on biological macromolecules. Max Perutz and John Kendrew got the chemistry prize for globular proteins. And Francis Crick, James Watson, and Morris Wilkins shared the prize in physiology or medicine for the structure of DNA. And this really marks the starting point of when structural biology went from vaguely understood blobs to well-defined atomic structures where we can really understand the chemical processes that lie behind what happens in biochemistry. Now, let me walk you through a few years of Nobel Prizes. I was serving on the Nobel Committee for Chemistry from 2003. And so I've taken from the period when I was involved in the work just to look at a number of prizes that involve crystal. And what you will see is that today you don't get the Nobel Prize for a new structure, but it's probably the other way around. Unless you have structure information, it's difficult to say that you understand the system well enough to be awarded. Agrin McKinnon worked on channels that transport water or ions through the cell membrane. Rose Hershko and Shikanover worked on ubiquity, a protein that is attached to other proteins which will be degraded once this kiss of death has been attached to it. And understanding what this protein looks like and how you can recognize it, of course, is an important part of this discovery. In 2006, Roger Kornberg gave us the molecular basis for transcription for how DNA is copied into RNA in order to make it accessible for protein synthesis. In 2008, Simomura, Chalfi, and Chen gave us the fantastic technology of the green fluorescent protein. Again, this is not a structural prize, but knowing the structure of this protein made it possible to modify it and to come up with versions in many different colors, very useful for biomedical research. In 2009, Ramakrishna, Steitz, and Yonat got a prize that was really one that had to do with the X-ray structure, that of the ribosome, an immensely complex biological assembly. In 2011, Danny Sheshtma had shown us that crystals don't necessarily need to be periodic. We had thought so for hundreds of years. Um, he showed that crystals can be aperiodic and they can possess non-crystallographic symmetry. Weird and wonderful. In 2012, Kobil and Levkovitz gave us the mechanism behind um, deep protein coupled receptors, uh, a way of passing information through a cell membrane. Again, 
the structure was an important part of the science behind this discovery. In 2013, Paplas, Levitt and Warshall, well, that was a prize on computational chemistry, but the first computations on a protein were made by Levitt and, Car uh, Levitt and Warshall. And they were working on one of the first enzymes that had been crystallized and solved because that was the only way where there was sufficient information to start understanding the theory of protein and enzyme action. And finally, in 2015, Lindahl, Modrich, and Sankar um, worked on DNA repair. And of course, again, the molecular understanding of DNA repair involves knowledge of the proteins and enzymes involved in this highly complex series of mechanisms, which makes the difference between roughly understanding what's going on because we know what entities that are involved and having a detailed understanding where we actually know the chemical mechanisms that underlie all these processes. What's up? What's happening next in structural science? Well, a very big part of the future of structural science lies in big science. In the first part of this image, you, I've got a, um, a scale of, of, of intensity of light. Um, measured in, in the amount of photons per, per uh, solid angle and time. And you see the typical X-ray tube, which is somewhere around 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8. Looking straight into the sun is a couple of orders of magnitude higher. Um, a second generation synchrotron you find at 10 to the 15. A fourth generation synchrotron at 10 to the 20th. And adding to this picture, three electron lasers pop somewhere around 10 to the 33rd, 10 to the 34th. This tells us that going from the X ray tubes used by the Brax um, to a modern X fell, there is a, a development of 10 to the 25 in X-ray intensity. This, of course, means that we are doing very different things today, depending on, on this enormous flux. We're not interested in solving the structure of sodium chloride 10 to the 25 times a week. We're interested in doing entirely new things. This is illustrated very clearly in the solution of protein structures. Now, myoglobin was the first protein structure. It was solved in 1958. It took seven years before lysozyme, the first enzyme structure was discovered. Hundreds of men and women years later, lots of work went into it. Now, I made a small experiment. I started downloading images from the protein data bank of protein structures solved last March. Now, I thought I should make a movie of them just to see what happens in a single month, of a single year. But I ran out of patience. So this is only about a quarter of them. We are blinded by images, by the constant barrage of images. And we have to ask ourselves, is, is this just becoming stamp collected? We don't want to solve the structure of sodium chloride 10 to the 25 times a week. We want to do something different. And with the new X-ray sources, we can do very different things. First of all, the power of the image is sometimes a little bit dangerous because it makes us look at a powerful technique and use that powerful technique because it provides us with answers. But sometimes we ask the questions that we know can be answered by the technique 
rather than finding out how can we how can we get an answer to this very important question? We rephrase the question so that we, it can be answered. Very much like someone searching for the car keys under the lamp where there is light, rather than where they were lost. Now, what Synchrotron helps us to do is to actually look at problems that are much more complex. We can look at disordered systems. We can look at dynamic systems. We can look at very, very small crystals, uh, and we can bring resolution to problems that previously looked unresolvable. So I've got an image for you here of a document, which of course is much too small to read. Now, with modern technology, what we can do is we can get it, give it high resolution. And this is, I think, the important thing to realize about all the commissions I spoke to before about the in the IUCR, about the role of X-ray crystallography. Now, if X-ray crystallography can give you resolution to the image, you still have to interpret what the image means. In this case, the image is that of a page of the Book of St. Albans, a, um, a book in medieval English about hunting. Now, even if you have the power to resolve this image very well, you need the help of other experts in order to understand it. You need handwriting experts. You need experts in medieval English language. You need experts in the, in the social codes of this time. There are so many more things than just the power to go from, from darkness, light, and then from low resolution to high resolution. That's something that diffraction can provide you with. But you have to combine it with a lot of other techniques in order to answer the more deep lying questions. Thanks. So I invite you to try out X-ray diffraction, try out what is available and offered by the by the techniques that are covered by the by the IUCR. Um, visit our journals, visit our meetings. And think about X-ray diffraction as one of the many techniques that can be useful for solving the particular problems in your branch of science. Welcome to Crystal City, the future. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for, for the talk. I, I, I enjoyed it a lot. And uh, I would like to ask you some questions. So first, you talked about mostly about X-ray diffraction. Um, so is that because of your personal work? So do you only work with X-rays or is it because in your union you only work with X-rays or is it because it's the most important method uh, there is in crystallography? I would say at the... It's a question that needs to be answered in many different ways. <laughs> so, so yes, I am, to a large extent, I work with x-rays. And if you look at the, at the people who work with crystallography, uh, most of them are x-ray crystallographers. There is certainly a lot of crystallography going on uh, with electrons. So electron diffraction is a very important technique. Um, you can also do diffraction with neutrons. Um, and that provides you with a completely different set of information. Uh, many crystallographers also use different techniques, but crystallography itself is really about diffraction. And so the vast majority of the people who are involved and call themselves crystallographers are diffraction specialists. And of course, if you are doing diffraction, X-ray diffraction is still the most useful uh, usual method, not necessarily the most useful method, but the most used method, simply because of the availability 
of x-rays and very powerful x-ray sources. But I hope that my, my, um, um, my examples of, of all the Nobel Prizes in chemistry from the uh, 12, 15 years uh, in, in the just past shows that it's just one facet of science. And I think it's also very well reflected in the commissions of the IUCR that deal with, with NMR, with microscopy, with computational methods, that it's, it's a single facet which needs to be completed with other facets in order to work well. There are people who work exclusively with diffraction as a technique. And, and of course, you can be a, an expert, you can be a methods expert working as a scientist. But for most users, crystallography is just one of many techniques that provide answers to other questions than those which are deal strictly with crystallography. Okay, so that is, that is now uh, a question from a student perspective. What do you think is uh, the better choice for a young student to go into the methods and become an expert in, in one specific method, for example, X-ray crystallography, or should you become more, try to be more broad and concentrate on developing samples and then using using methods? So what, what, what was your way of doing it and what is what you would recommend to young students? Well, I have been, um... I've been going back and forth, I would say. I, I started out as a, um, as a modeler. Um, I did my, my first postdoc at the Australian National University in applied mathematics. And, and I was looking at uh, a particular way of modeling uh, soft matter systems. Um, I later became interested in, in getting more information on these systems. And so I became a, a diffraction user. I wasn't during my PhD days. I, I, uh, this is something that I've developed later. And I have since worked both with questions that deal with um, material science. So I've been working a lot of thermoelectric materials, which of course is again, more of, a, uh, of an applied perspective. But in the work that I have done, I have been, I have needed to revisit the structural methods in order to, to get answers to questions about the use of thermoelectrics and, and how to optimize them. And then I have returned to structural science. I think it is, it is very useful to be an expert in a particular technique. It gives you uh, a home turf. Uh, at the same time, you you want a you want a problem set that goes outside of your own comfort zone. It keeps you on your toes. It make means that you need to develop continuously, and perhaps most importantly, it gives you impulses into different areas. And science is about to in my experience, to a large extent about people, about the people you meet and the people you work with. They will give you impulses into new areas. And by having a strong methodological background, you do have a place to start thinking about the problem. You may realize that this particular problem isn't really addressable through the methods that, that you know best, and then you will need to learn new methods. But having, again, a home turf, a method that you know well, you have a different way of looking at how to learn new techniques, uh, how to understand the limitations of a technique, and when to ask for help. Uh, it's never about proving that your method is the best for the purpose. Uh, it may be in a particular setting and at at a particular time in history, but the scientific problems are there to be addressed in as many ways as possible to give, to give a full answer. And therefore, you need to know your methods, you need to be 
an expert on some of them, but you need to be aware that there is a richness of methods out there which you may need to employ in order to solve a particular problem. And then you need collaboration. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that answer. I think that was very, very nice. Uh, now I will go on something more practical. So you mentioned these light sources, these immensely huge light sources. And uh, I'm myself an electron microscopist. So I have to ask this critical question, like in an electron microscope, in a modern one, for maybe 5 million euros, you get the atomic resolution and direct imaging of the structure. So why should we build an X-ray laser? Uh, no, not an, an electron, free electron laser, which is like, 10 or 100 times more expensive if we can do direct imaging of basic, if we could do direct imaging of, of any material at the atomic level in an electron microscope. So why do we need these big facilities? Well, that's that's a very good question. And I think uh, it's, it's a complicated question uh, because first of all, we, are, we get slightly different answers from the different techniques that we use. And so the, the free electron lasers are particularly useful in looking at dynamics. So we can look at molecules in solution and we can change that solution as the, as the uh, stream of sample passes through the beam, which means that we have a method that can have a, an extremely high temporal resolution as well. And so the real power of, of an X-ray laser is the fact that it provides us not only with resolution at the nano scale, but also at the picosecond. Um, this is, of course, extremely useful. You still should ask the question, uh, can we afford these facilities? Um, and I think in structural science, um, the, the XFELs and also the neutron sources are becoming extremely expensive. And I think there will be a limit to how much money we can spend on facilities like these. And I think if you look at other areas where huge investments are needed to drive science, there will be a limit to what is actually doable. Uh, I am certainly no expert on, on particle physics, but where is the next uh, where is the next power of ten coming from in particle particle physics after after what's being done in CERN at the moment? Um, what's rather surprising is that large scale facilities tend to have multiple roads. They're not only places where you can technically do very interesting experiments, but they are also hotspots of collaboration. So they bring people together and they are uh, fantastic training grounds for, for young people. Uh, I would say that one of the most useful um, features of synchrotron radiation facilities is the fact that um, PhD students and postdocs working there get exposed to the full set of problems that can be attacked with structural methods. And so they end up with a very complex, but perhaps uh, the most complete uh, picture that we have on what's doable in science at the moment. Uh, and that has, a, that has a value in itself. Um, at the same time, we should be aware that the way that techniques are developing, um, some areas um, change so dramatically that old techniques become more or less outdated. And there is, at the moment, of course, there is a, uh, a fantastic development when it comes to cryo EM, where you look at frozen uh, molecules, um, not even crystals, but actually molecules, which can be, which can be uh, 
analyzed in great structural detail and where you can also look at chemical reactions, not in real time, but by looking at, at different, um, Quite sure what's going on at my computer. <laughs> I think you're getting a call or some. Something. I'm afraid I am. Yes. Um, let's see if I can turn this off. Does that help? No. Uh, well. So, um, so, of course, uh, methods change over time, and. Um, we are just at the beginning of a revolution in, in um, what's doable by, by cryo-EM. And I'm sure that the problems that will be attacked using cryo-EM and the problems that will be attacked using X-ray methods uh, will, will change. And, and there will be, at the moment, it's quite clear that for very, very large assemblies, it is better to work with IOEM. For somewhat smaller assemblies, uh, crystallization and x-ray procedures are still more efficient. But the question is where these borders will be. Um, I think we should be aware of the fact that things are going, things are going to continue continuously change and methods are going to be used in different areas depending on where they are best suited. Okay, thank you. Um, so maybe for for people who don't know don't know that much about uh, imaging of biological samples and also about X-ray, could you explain why we need these extremely bright sources? So as far as I understand it, the samples are relatively fragile, and you want to get as much information out of them as possible. Is that is that correct, or why do we need an um, an X-ray source, which is 25 orders of magnitude stronger than the X-ray sources we had before. Well, apart from the fact that you can look at much smaller samples, you can look at, at disordered samples and so on. Uh, one, of the, one of the big advantages of a, of a very, very powerful source is that you can, you can determine the structural configuration of a, of a large and complicated system in a single shot. Uh, and this means that as you as you study a system that is under irradiation, it changes if you're looking at a biological system. If you're looking at silicon, it normally survives quite well the, um, the bombardment of electrons in an electron microscope or x-rays in, in, in a diffraction experiment. But a biological system is often very, very sensitive, both to the sort of knock-on damage that you get from, um, from exposing it to radiation, but also just from the, just from the, the, um, the redox reactions that take place in radiation. And so one open question today where, where we, we have a lot of structural information but we are still looking at, at the finer details is um, um, photosystem two. Uh, so one of the, one of the um, very important actions of green plants in, in order to, to, uh, to fixate oxygen. Now, the photosystem itself is highly sensitive to light. And so the question is, if we do an experiment that lasts more than a few nanoseconds. We may be looking at a damaged sample. Mm -hmm. And so only by having a, a pulsed source where we can look at a single pulse with sufficient intensity to give us the full story in one shot, only then are we able to actually tell what the structure looked like before it was irradiated. Um, such a system cannot be frozen, it cannot be exposed to vacuum, and it cannot be studied for a long period of time. So this is typically the sort of, of experiment where you really need to have a, a very, very powerful source. 
Um, it's also true that if you look at systems that are poorly ordered, you get a much, much weaker signal. And you need to look at very small areas to see if, or, or volumes of the sample to see, is this a homogeneous sample or not? And so by studying with a high spatial resolution, with a high temporal resolution, you have you stand a chance of understanding what this sample is. This is where you need the very, very powerful. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the explanation. Uh, so next I would ask something a bit different. So you mentioned that you have, I don't remember how many journals it was that the IUCR publishes. And I wanted to ask on how, how open access uh, publishing is, is handled uh, by the IUCR. Uh, because you, you mentioned that, for example, you're also trying to involve other countries and not all universities have the money and not all scientists are at, at facilities which have the money to pay for all these sometimes very expensive journals. So mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you on the on the opinion of the IUCR on, on that. Mm -hmm. So some of our journals are, are open access and th these are these are typically journals where production costs are, are uh, relatively moderate, uh, which means that you can publish in, in um, you can publish structural reports at the cost of a few hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. um, for our more complex journals and, and uh, those that deal with the foundations of crystallography tend to be very expensive to, to uh, produce uh, because the technical editing is extremely complicated. It's mostly, it's, it's mostly mathematics. And, and so it takes highly skilled personnel to, to do the proofreading and to, to do the typesetting of these journals. Uh, for these, we still have to a large extent a classical model. So these are these are paid subscriptions through uh, through the large deals that are brokered today at, at libraries. However, for for countries where science is still developing, uh, we have special deals so that we supply these journals either free of charge or at reduced rates. And when it comes to the journals that we produce as open access. Uh, we we waiver we waive the open access fees for people in institutions where there is difficulty in in paying these. Mm -hmm. um, in the long run, of course, we are looking at a business model where we will be fully open access. We believe that that is the that will be the future of publishing. Um, at the same time. There are many challenges with going open access, changing the business model, and we are a small publishing house. And we are a little bit afraid that, that the small publishing houses will be the ones having the most difficulties in making the transition. Um, there are big risks involved on the way, and, and we don't have uh, any funds to fall back on. We, we, we are a, we are, we have, somewhere between 20 and 25 employees who work with the journals for the union. And uh, we don't have a, uh, we haven't got stockpiles of, <laughs> of ready cash to, to, uh, to winter them over uh, unless we have a good way of dealing with going from a subscription model to an open access model. That is why we are, we are trying to achieve this in a, more or less continuous fashion. So we are shifting. We're now using a hybrid model, uh, but I would like to point out that, so any proceeds that we are making, hybrid models tend to be, tend to be uh, frowned upon, looked as double dipping. So you, you, you have to pay for the subscription. You also have to pay for the, the open access. Uh, but the, the profits that the union makes uh, is exactly what goes into our outreach program and the young scientists program. So we are not we're not accumulating money. We are trying to make a profit on our journals, uh, ideally 
around 5% to stay alive, mm -hmm. uh, but also to be able to support the, uh, the work we do with outreach and young scientists programs. Um, all that being said, uh, it's scientific publishing is, is a very difficult area to be in at the moment. And we are, we do believe that we serve a very important purpose in, in uh, providing uh, Learn Society publishing. Uh, we do believe that Learn Society publishing is, will be, continue to be a very important mode of, of accessing high quality journals for scientists. Uh, but we need to adapt to changes uh, in the publishing ecosystem that we see around us. Uh, but we, at the moment, we have a mixed model, open access and prescription. Okay. Thanks for answering this, this difficult, this question in this difficult field. So uh, I think I'm coming to the end <clears throat> of my questions. So if uh, somebody from the audience has a question, please, please answer, uh, please ask them on one of the chats. And in the meantime, I would like to ask about your commission. So you said that you have a teaching commission and that you have an art commission. Uh, so what can one imagine if you're talking about an art commission? I mean, teaching is quite easy. You train people on instrumentation. Uh, but what does the art commission do? So the full name is Art and Cultural Heritage, and it deals with the use of crystallographic techniques in looking at artifacts and art. Um, it started out very much as, a, as a, a way of understanding techniques and materials used by artists um, from long back. It has since had several applications when it comes to dealing with um, fraud in art. Uh, to establish um, whether a work of art was produced at the time uh, when it's claimed that it was. Um, but by using the technique, uh, by using X-ray and neutron based techniques, diffraction and spectroscopy, uh, it's possible to establish not only what pigments that we used, but also how these pigments were treated. Uh, you can look at grain size distributions to tell uh, how uh, how things were being handled, if they were hand milled, if they were precipitated, and so on. Um, and there has been even a period in time. I'm not sure if it's still true, but where the Louvre in 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 France had had. Uh, direct access to one of the beam lines at the big synchrotron at the ESRF. So they had they had proprietary beam time there in order to look at art and to verify whether this was, you can't verify that something is real, but you can verify that it fits material wise with the requirements for, for a particular period of time. Uh, you can also, because X-rays are, for many purposes, a non-destructive method, which means you can do you can do mapping of large parts of a, a work of art and to reveal if there are imaging images under the image that is visible. Uh, you can look at previous work being done on the same canvas, um, and I think one of the most exciting developments that we have seen has been the uh, the identification of trace pigments on marble statues. The, uh, the white marble statues of antiquity were covered in bright colors. They have just worn off. And by using mapping techniques, we can, we can recreate uh, how these were colored and we can, we can um, uh, make nice computer images of what these statues would have looked like when they were in use. And, and so they're nowhere near the sort of white marble that we have come, come to associate with classical times, but rather um, 
brightly colored and perhaps a bit gaudy. <laughs> Okay, that is actually something completely different than I imagined. I imagined that particularly beautiful images of structures would count as art, but that that makes a lot more sense. Okay, but, but of course you can you can uh, you can look at it that way, but I don't think that uh, uh, I don't think that's the main thrust. It's it's really it's really about understanding the what we can what we can do with cultural heritage objects. Uh, using the methods. Okay, so uh, I have uh, one, one of the favorite things that you said was that crystallography is taking images of the atomic world. And I really, I really liked, I really liked that sentence. I think I'm going to keep that for myself as well. And uh, as we have had no questions in the chat, uh, I would like to ask you if you have something you still want to tell our audience uh, or you want to give young people on their way to uh, on their careers and if you have something you want to share and except for that i would already like to thank you for your time and yeah maybe you well the the most important part of course is have fun that's uh, <laughs> um i have made very few conscious choices in my career um, I, I was looking for enjoyment and beauty. Um, uh, the, I, I, my first modeling work, um, uh, when I was, when I was, uh, doing more mathematical modeling was, was driven very much from the point of view of, of curiosity at, at, of shapes that I found intriguing and beautiful. Um, then I changed area multiple times and i think that is a that is a very useful thing to do um i've worked at various places in the world that's a very useful thing to do i think today of course it's very difficult to travel um we should perhaps we should travel a bit less we should certainly travel in a different way thinking about how to be more sustainable, but it's extremely important that science remains international. And one of the most useful things that you learn uh, in a career of science is that the impact of people from different areas and with different backgrounds helps build science in a way that makes it more robust and more ready to face up to changes. Um, we, we should avoid at all costs, this we know well from biology, we should avoid at all costs having science that becomes a monoculture. That is very, very sensitive to disturbances. Uh, we, need a, we need science being practiced all over the globe by individuals of with as many backgrounds as possible in order to make science vibrant, but also to make science accepted as the way to understand the world. Um, science can be exclusive in its nature. That is, that is one of the big challenges of science, to be accessible and to provide understandable answers to important questions. So that's your job. Do it well, make me proud. Okay, thank you. That was a very beautiful answer. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you also for your time and that you have come here on this digital platform to uh, have this interview with us. And I think this was the last session of this week. If I'm wrong, then Duarte should correct me. And uh, thank you very much. And thank you for thanks to all the people who have come here to listen to us and to get an insight on the physics of crystallography. Thank you for having me.
Uh, yeah, just to mention, uh, we have a couple more sessions this week. We have one today um, on uh, geomagnetism and aeronomy, uh, uh, and another one tomorrow on physics for development. So a couple of those more this week, and next week we have more. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.